So in this video, we're just going to start by introducing the concept of a metaphor, something I'm sure you, you know about already. We're just going to start thinking about certain examples of metaphors. We're going to note some important features about metaphors, things that we might want to try and explain using a theory of metaphor. And then finally, we're going to isolate some important questions and distinguish some important questions about metaphor and sort of zoom in on the questions that we're going to focus on for the rest of the lecture. So if you want to find good examples of metaphors, literature is often the place to look, literature or poetry. So if you look at the handout, there are a few examples of metaphors from some classic texts. From Romeo and Juliet, we have the line, Juliet is the sun. This is a metaphor. Sentence number two on the handout, history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to wake. This is something said by one of James Joyce's characters, Stephen Dedalus. But it's also, we see examples of metaphors in philosophy. So if you look at sentence three, philosophy is the battle of the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of our language. This is actually a quote from Wittgenstein describing what it is to do philosophy metaphorically. So what is it about all these examples that makes them metaphors? Well, one thing seems to be that we're saying that one thing is another. That's a common feature of metaphor. But of course, we don't mean it literally. Romeo is not asserting the obvious falsehood that Juliet literally is identical to the sun, that Juliet is a flaming ball of hydrogen in space. That's clearly not what Romeo is saying. Rather, he's inviting some sort of comparison between Juliet and the sun. He might say that there are certain kinds of features that they share or something like that. Now that, of course, is a little bit difficult to spell out, as we'll see later on, because what features of the sun exactly is it that Juliet shares? But at a first pass, it might be something like Romeo is saying that Juliet is is bright or glorious or worthy of worship or something like that, or beautiful. These are all kind of properties that we might think that Romeo is inviting us to ascribe to Juliet, just like we might ascribe them to the sun. When we think about the quote from, U from Ulysses, the Stephen Dedalus line, history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake, well, saying a history is a nightmare, first of all, saying that something is a nightmare clearly is not a compliment. It's saying that it's something bad. But importantly, that trying to awake from, when Dedalus says he's trying to awake from history, he's trying to escape it in some way or get out of it. So again, while that line is not meant literally, he's not literally saying that history is a sort of state of being in a particular bad dream. He's saying it's like being in a state of bad dream, and just like one might want to escape from a bad dream by waking up, Daedalus wants to escape his country's history um, by escaping from his country, essentially. So often in a metaphor, we say something that is literally false, but we use that somehow to communicate, you might think, something true. At the very least, we invite some sort of comparison between the two objects that people tend to find illuminating, or, at least, or is supposed to be illuminating. It's supposed to illuminate what Juliet is like by comparing her to the sun. It's supposed to illuminate what history is like for Daedalus by comparing it to a nightmare that he's trying to get out of. So those are some examples of metaphor. One thing that's really important to start with when we think about metaphor is that what exactly metaphors communicate is extremely hard to pin down, and it's very, very subtle indeed. To see an example of how, how subtle it can be, we can imagine as you can see on the handout, a trio of different cases. So imagine a mother says to a child, any one of the following, you are a pig, you are a sow, you are a piglet. Now these three are kind of similar. So each of them, the literal content is that the mother is saying the child is some kind of pig. In the first one, they're just straight forwardly saying they're a pig. In the second one, they're saying they're a female pig. And the last one, they're saying they're a, 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 a baby pig, a, a piglet. But even though they're kind of similar, it seems like what the metaphor is and what it communicates is very different in each of the cases. In the first one, where the mother says the child is a pig, they're saying something like the child is very slovenly or dirty or messy. In the final one, where they're saying they're a piglet, it's a little bit harder to say, but it seems like they might be in part attributing attributing cuteness to the child, which they're certainly not doing if they're saying that they're a pig. And in the sow one, it's even much harder to say what's going on. It's, very, it's kind of hard to put into words exactly what would be meant by saying you're a sow. So if metaphors are really very subtle indeed, what exactly they're communicated is really sensitive to the exact choice of words. Because what we saw in that example was 
whether you use pig or sow or piglet, has a huge difference on what the metaphor does. The other thing that's very important to say about metaphors is that they're actually extremely common. It's natural to think that metaphor is something we do when we're writing poetry, or when we're writing novels, or more generally that metaphor is something that we resort to when we're interested in artistic expression rather than expression of the facts and what the world is like. But if you think about it for even a little while, it becomes pretty clear that that's not right at all. That metaphors are actually everywhere. In fact, saying that metaphors are everywhere, that's, that's probably a metaphor in itself. Think about any of the classes you do in this in, at Texas Tech. Probably at some points when your lecturer wants to explain some difficult concept, they'll resort to a metaphor. We've probably seen plenty of examples of, of that in, even in just this class, of using metaphors to explain a difficult new concept or a difficult argument. So metaphors really aren't something that are just sort of poetic flights of, flights of fancy. They're actually something that can be extremely useful from the point of view of communication. If you want to get somebody to grok on to something that you're explaining, if you want to get them to really understand it, sometimes a metaphor can do just the trick. So, so metaphors can play a very important role in just straightforward communication, in sharing thoughts and sharing beliefs. It can be an excellent way of getting people to, to grip on to what you're saying. So those are some important facts about metaphors. We've seen some examples of them. We've said that the meanings of a metaphor is extremely subtle, can be very sensitive to the exact choice of words. And then finally, we said that they're, they're really everywhere. Metaphors are extremely prevalent. We use them all the time. I want to now isolate the kinds of questions we're going to be talking about today. What are precisely the questions about metaphor that we're going to be trying to answer? And because there are a number of different questions you could be interested in here. And so it's very important that we're clear on what we're trying to do. We're going to talk about three questions. The first one I'm going to mention just because it is, it is important to have on our radar, but it's not going to be our primary focus. It's the second and third questions I'm going to talk about. Those are going to be the focus of the various different accounts of metaphor that we talk about today. The first question you might ask is, well, just what is the definition of a metaphor? How do we define metaphor in a way that separates the metaphorical uses of language from all the non-metaphorical uses of language? You might have thought this question was actually easy to answer. You might have thought the answer is just, well, Something is a metaphor if you're using a sentence non-literally. But there are actually a number of pretty obvious problems with this attempt to define it. The first problem is just, well, what exactly do we mean by literal speech? And you might worry that there's a thread of circularity here. Because if somebody asks you to explain what literal speech is, you would probably say things like, well, you're using speech literally when you're not using it metaphorically or figuratively, or something like that. But now it looks like the definition of literal is appealing to metaphorical, and the definition of metaphorical is appealing to the definition of literal. So we're involved in a, in a circle here. That's all to say that just trying to define metaphor in terms of non-literal speech, that's only good if we think we have an independent grip on what it is for something to be literal. The second problem is that just saying that metaphors are non-literal speech basically commits you to thinking, well, they, they're the, that all kinds of non-literal speech are metaphors. Because if that's the definition of a metaphor, something is a metaphor, if it's a non-literal use of speech, then any use of non-literal speech counts as a metaphor. But arguably that's not obviously true. So we had things like loose talk. Suppose I say that somebody is six foot tall. Now, very rarely when we say that people are six foot tall, do we mean that they are exactly six foot tall. They could be a shade over six, they could be a shade under six, and we'd still be pretty happy to call them six foot tall. But strictly speaking, you might think what we said is not literally true. Someone could object by saying, well, they're not exactly six foot tall. They're roughly six foot tall. So loose talk, this kind of example where we use our words loosely and we say, some, we say things that are approximately true rather than rather than exactly true, is arguably a form of non-literal speech. Now, it's not as drastic a form of non-literal speech as metaphor is, but arguably it is a form of non-literal speech. And that's a problem for this attempt to, de to define metaphor as non-literal speech. Do we really want to say that loose talk is a form of metaphor? Or when I'm speaking loosely, am I speaking metaphorically? There are people who think the answer is yes, but it's not obvious the answer is yes. If we think about example of saying somebody is six foot tall when they're a little bit over or a little bit under, 
That does seem pretty different from saying something like Juliet is the sun or history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. They don't really feel exactly the same. So it's not clear that we can really just define metaphor as non-literal speech. It might be one example of non-literal speech, but there could be plenty of other examples as well. Loose talk might be one of them. So this is our first question of, well, what is a metaphor? How do you define what a metaphor is? Of course, this is an important question. It's not going to be the one that we focus on in large part today. It's not the kind of question that the accounts of metaphor we're going to be looking at try to answer. But that's okay, because even if we can't define it, we have a relatively good sense of what metaphors are. You can identify a metaphor. Like if I ask you whether a particular sentence that somebody says was a metaphorical use of speech or not, we're pretty good at saying when something is a metaphor or not. So it's okay if we don't define it, we have a relatively good understanding of it. And that understanding is going to be enough to try and dig into our other two questions for today. The second question we're going to talk about is what exactly is the content of a metaphor? So go back to our earlier examples, like when Romeo says Juliet is the sun. What kind of thing is he saying? What kind of thing is he expressing? In particular, is it the same kind of thing that we communicate using literal speech? Now, just to be careful here, when I say, is it the same kind of thing, obviously, Romeo is not saying that Juliet is literally the sun, that she is a huge chemical reaction happening in space. But you might think that there, even though he is not saying exactly what the sentence says, there's some other proposition, there's some other belief he has that he's trying to share and he's expressing with the use of the sentence. So this is the question about, this is our second question about metaphor. When I use a metaphor to communicate something, am I saying that something is the case? Am I making an assertion? Am I saying something true or false about the world? Just like I might be saying something true or false about the world when I express something using a sentence literally. Now obviously I won't be saying exactly the same thing as that sentence says, but I could be saying something else. So just to help you a little bit more or get a grasp on what this might be like, think about when we talked about implicature last week. When we talked about implicature last week, we saw there were examples where people say, where people are able to say more using a sentence than what the sentence literally means. When I say something like, the professor has really good handwriting, I communicate more than just a, an assertion about his handwriting. But I'm still making an assertion. I'm making an assertion about the professor and his teaching abilities. And we might ask, is metaphor similar? When we say something metaphorically, are we still making an assertion, even if it's different from what that sentence would assert when literally used? So sh should we think of, me of uses of metaphor as kind of instances of thought sharing? The very beginning of the course, we talk talked about this idea of language as enabling us to share thoughts. When I have a belief that a mushroom is poisonous, a way for me to share that with you is to say the sentence, the mushroom is poisonous, to assert that the mushroom is poisonous. We might ask, is metaphor a way to share beliefs using sentences in non-standard ways? Are there beliefs that I can share using a sentence, but using it metaphorically rather than literally? So do metaphors make assertions? Are they used to share beliefs? Or are they used to, to do something different? We're going to see different theories which take different stances on this question. Some will say, when you use a metaphor, you really are just trying to share a belief. You're, you are making an assertion, just not the assertion that that sentence is usually make, used to make. Other theories are going to say, no, you're actually not making an assertion at all. Metaphors are not in the business of stating a fact. Rather, they do something really very different. So that's going to be our second question, and one we're going to be really interested in today. Our third question is going to be kind of an epistemological question. And it's the question of, well, how do we figure out exactly what a speaker is trying to do with a, meta with a metaphor? As we saw with our examples at the beginning, when you have a metaphor, clearly you're trying to say something other than what the literal meaning is. But a very important question is, well, how do we actually do that? When Romeo says, Juliet is the sun, how is the audience able to figure out what he means? How, is, how are they able to try and figure out what he's getting at with that metaphor? Similarly with the Joyce example, how do we know that Stephen Dedalus is saying something about history being bad and wanting to escape from it when he used that metaphor? How are we able to do that? How are we able to figure out what the speakers mean when they use these metaphors? So this is a question in particular about the audience. How do audiences figure out what metaphors are being used to do? And if you think about it, 
this does not seem like a particularly easy question to answer. Because there are a whole range of things metaphors can be used to do, and it's a re it's a really extremely context sensitive. But it's going to be a really important question for a theory of metaphor to, to say something about how we're able to figure out what a particular metaphor means on a particular occasion. Because if it doesn't give any guide to that, you might wonder, you might worry how good an account of metaphor really is. We want to be able to explain how people really are able to communicate something or affect their audience in a certain way. But a good theory of metaphor should say something about how that's possible. It should say something about how that actually happens. If it doesn't, you might wonder whether it really is a good theory of metaphor. So that's the end for this, this segment. We started off talking about what metaphors are. We saw some examples, both from literature and philosophy. We saw that metaphors are very sensitive to wording. In the mother-child case, depending on whether you're using the word pig, sow, or piglet, the resulting metaphor seems to communicate something potentially very, very different. And then we also made the observation that metaphors are, are sort of everywhere. They're not just something that we use in artistic expression. They're something we use in academic contexts or, or contexts where straightforward communication is sort of what we're after. And then the last thing we did was we demarcated these three questions that are going to be our focus today. And really the last two are the main ones. So we asked the question, what is metaphor? What distinguishes metaphor from literal speech? The second question was, well, what do metaphors actually do? Do we make assertions using metaphors? Are we trying to say something that's true or false, albeit something different from what that sentence usually says? Or are we trying to do something completely different? Or do we use metaphors to do something very different from making assertions? And the last question is, well, whatever it is that metaphors are used to do, how does the audience actually figure out that that's what the speaker is trying to do? How do they make this, the precise pair, how do they go from the literal content of the sentence that the speaker is saying to whatever it is that the, the speaker intends for them to associate or to believe or whatever you think metaphors do? And as I said, these last two questions, the question about what do metaphors mean, are they assertions, and the questions about how does the audience figure out what they're doing, these are the central ones that our theories of metaphor are going to try and explain.